Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Pod Save Chocolate. My name is Clay Gordon. I'm your host and moderator today. And we're going to jump into a topic that I think is going to be near and dear to many people at this time of year. Um, we're on January 2nd, and many people at this time of year make resolutions. And often those resolutions have something to do with your health. And for some reason, I think that people look at chocolate as something that they might um, add to their diet or take away from their diet uh, in an attempt to be quote unquote healthier um, over the course of the coming year. Uh, I personally find that those kinds of resolutions are really, really hard um, to keep on top of. But today what we have is a regular contributor to the Chocolate Life and a guest here on either the Chocolate Life Live, his first guest here on Pod, uh, as a guest on Pod Save Chocolate is Keith Ayub. Keith, how are you today? I am doing well, thanks. Great, so I'm guessing if you're like many of me, many people who are watching this, um, you may have indulged or overindulged over the course of the last couple of weeks. How do you think about your performance, you know, in the weeks leading up to the new year? Uh, it's funny because um, overall, I probably ate more than I usually do, but I kind of, you know, watch before the Christmas season. So I wasn't too worried. Um, also, I'm really active and stay that way and both to kind of bust the stress of the holidays, but also to give me a chance to maybe eat a little bit more or drink a little bit more. I did do my own um, post on the one of the more caloric drinks you'll ever have, and that is holiday eggnog, which can really get up there. So I sort of said, you know, I talked about a lot of things that people could do to kind of tweak that a little bit. Um, you know, you don't have to have a big bucket full of eggnog. You can have a shot of eggnog and kind of get the you taste, things like you that. You don't need so, to have a big bucket full of well, eggnog. <laughs> But now that that's it, it. goes against everything I, I know I, about, I know. about I know. But okay. there there are ways right. actually. I've so what I want, that. But yeah. um, but chocolate, however, it's funny. You know, people oftentimes in the beginning of the year think, oh, I'm going to give up desserts or I'm going to give up chocolate, and then the more health information gets known about cocoa and chocolate, think, well, maybe that's not such a good thing to do. Um, maybe there's something redeeming about chocolate and maybe it has some health properties. So yeah, before people actually give up chocolate, I think what, are, what kind of chocolate are you thinking about? First of all, if you're giving up candy, that's maybe another thing, but giving up candy okay, so, and giving up chocolate are two different things. Right. So chocolate candy. So what I'm going to do for everyone is uh, just do a quick uh, screen switch here and to let everybody know, this is the homepage right now of the chocolate life, um, dot com. Um, and uh, for every single one of the episodes that uh, of these Pod Save Chocolate episodes, what I do is create a post. And so here is the post that Keith and I are going to be looking at um, today. You can go and look at it now. Um, and if you want to, all of the resources that we're going to be talking about are linked um, on this page. And if Keith and I talk about something that um, is not linked to on the page, we'll put it on the page afterwards. All right. So let's get started, Keith, if we can about this. So I'm I'm going to just switch very, very quickly um, over to this different view, focus on us rather than that page at the moment. So let's let's talk about that distinction about when we say chocolate as opposed to chocolate candy. What are we? So let, let's make that first distinction right off the top of my head, right off the top of our heads. OK, yeah, I, th I think of um, a, a chocolate bar as chocolate, especially, especially a dark chocolate bar, because it's going to have a higher level of uh, cocoa solids in there. Um, but a lot of people think of chocolate, when they say chocolate bar, they think of chocolate coated stuff, um, where it can be, um, I don't want to mention brand names, but we all kind of know what they are. Um, you know, it, it, it's fine. So we, we can mention brand names, mention product names. So okay, what I so might do yeah, is I might go it's... into my local CVS. I might look, go into my no local drugstore. CVS is the closest one to my house. And there is right. a candy aisle. And at the cap of one aisle, you'll see um, a selection of bars from Lint and Ghirardelli, right? Ghirardelli is owned by Lint. And for the most part, they many of them are solid chocolate bars. So a chocolate right. bar without a flavoring or an inclusion. Right. And then I might go into another part of the aisle and what I'll do is I'll see um, a candy bar. And so it might be a chocolate covered Snickers, right, or a right. Mounds or some other kind of bar. So what we want to do is we want to differentiate um, between chocolate and chocolate candy. Right? And what is it about chocolate candy, right, that turns out to be so big? bad for us if we can or it's, compared with a regular chocolate bar what is it about chocolate candy that we should be avoiding 
Well, you know, nothing is, you know, verboten. And I always tell people they don't have to think of excluding anything, you know, for the rest of their lives and things like that. That's ridiculous. Um, but the idea is how much and how often uh, rather than yes or no. But with, when it comes to chocolate coated bars or things like that, what what's really inside them is quite a high percentage of sugar. Um, most people could stand to cut back on their, 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 you know, their intake of sugar. In fact, 90% of people, um, and consistent with recommendations, sometimes the recommendations are absurdly low. Um, but I always tell people, if you cut back a little bit, that's probably better than not cutting back at all. Um, and see where that takes you, you know, so if they, um, you know, if they, and, but, but the idea is that's a really, really high source of sugar um, as, uh, but it's not the only one. And certainly sugary beverages are, are another one. Um, and if we looked at reducing our intake of um, sugary beverages, and I would say empty calorie foods, um, and that would be things like pie, cake, you know, candy, et cetera, that occupies about two thirds to three quarters of most people's sugar intake. If they could really cut back a little bit on that, that would go a long way to, uh, to you know, towards cutting back on total sugar intake. And then they don't have to worry about, you know, how much sugar is in my yogurt. Can people obsess about that kind of thing? And I think, you know what, concentrate on the stuff <laughs> that's not giving you any nutrients in addition. Um, now, when we get to chocolate bars, um, and especially high percentage chocolate bars, uh, high percentage cocoa, then we're getting into all of the antioxidants that chocolate tends to contain. Um, and if it's if it's handled properly, um, and not just that, it's, you know, but also chocolate products, things like cocoa powder and things like that, that are people that, that people might add sugar to, but they might not. Um, and that's getting into a little bit more of the health properties. Chocolate cocoa powder, for example, is a great source of fiber. And a lot of people don't think of that. But if you're making a hot chocolate from scratch, the more unsweetened cocoa powder you add, the more fiber you're going to have in that drink. Um, a lot of people don't think about that. Plus, chocolate has, um, you know, it, chocolate's got a lot of, you know, actually good antioxidants in it, minerals, et cetera. So it's it, it's actually cocoa powder in, in its pure form is a, um, it's, a, it's actually a pretty good food. And I'm afraid, Clay, you're cutting out. So I know you're talking probably, but I can't hear you. you know, a technology thing. Um, it oh, looks yeah. Like, I believe it's, it's and keeps you. Oh, I'm trying to understand, but I, you're cutting out a lot. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can go into um, another network room. connectivity problems. Can you yeah, you're cutting out a little bit more. Um, I'm as close to my router as I can get, but um, um, are, am I back, Keith? Are you back? You are back. You are back. Thank okay, you. So Again, I'm having some intermittent network. The wind is blowing in the wrong direction today, and the Wi-Fi is um, going oh. off. So while we're taking a quick break, uh, what I want to do is uh, want to remind everybody, if you have a question for Keith, something you'd like to let everybody know, you just go into the comments, whether you're on LinkedIn or Facebook or into the live chat, um, if you're on YouTube, and give us a quick shout out. So I want to say hello to... Uh, um, who's giving us a, head, a heads up today for Frank Manteau. Also, howdy, Frank, where you are. I'm um, looking forward to Mike King at Encore in Kansas City and uh, Mark hey, Lee, up in, uh, um, up in, um, up in Kittredge, Colorado. Thanks everybody for connecting today. So, you know, Keith, what I want to, I want to go back to a couple of the points that you made, because I think it's really important to think about. So when I went to my doctor, this is like in 2019, and he said, you know, I have a history of managing blood sugar in my family. Yeah. And, you know, the doctor said to me, okay, um, what I want you to do is I want you to think about not going on a keto diet, but think about like total carbohydrate load over the course of the day. 
And so I said, okay, what we want to do is we want to see if we can get you on a target good of like 100 grams of net carbs in a day. And what I did then was I went and looked at, you know, all of my favorite foods and figured out what the carbohydrate content and what the net, so after carbohydrates minus, um, minus fiber, minus so fiber. what the net carbs, my net carbs were and everything. And I just sort of built up a sort of idea in my mind, right, about what 100 grams looked like. I didn't obsess over, you know, whether it was six grams or seven grams, right? And then what I could do is I could sort of think about how do I want to incorporate those um, into my day? So if I went and, you know, splurged in the morning, right. right, I knew that I would have to be more careful for the rest of the day. Or what I could do is I could be very careful in the morning, knowing that I was going out and splurging. And so I didn't, I didn't deprive myself of the things that I loved. So if I, you know, and I continued to judge chocolate and eat chocolate and all those kinds of things, not necessarily something that thinking of so you know what do you think about just sort of that way of thinking about things sort of set yourself a goal give yourself a sort of an idea about what that means and then you know work towards it without obsessing over it yeah um and first of all i'm not a big fan of obsession about anything i don't know that it really helps us any um that what, what your approach is one <clears throat> excuse me is one way to go um and for somebody who is not a severe diabetic and stuff, that's an option um, because you have a little bit more freedom about that. Um, right. and, and, and what I think was good about your taking some action was that you did it before things got really out of control and really bad, where your mm -hmm. doctor would have said, OK, all bets are off. You've really got to focus on right. this. So, you know, you, you got a little proactive and you got out in front of it, which is really what I, I hope most people would do um, and, and 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 become also more mindful of, you know, the amount of right. um, total, both total carbohydrate, total sugar, et cetera. I usually tell people also focus on, first of all, what you need to have in your diet first of all, and what your diet might be missing. Let's get the gaps filled up first and then see how much in the, you know we have to play around with because you still don't want to cut out any particular food groups. Um, and let people think, well, I'm going to not eat any you know bread or not have pasta again. It's like, well, okay, but again, is that realistic? Probably not. Plus, there's bread and there's bread and there's pasta and there's pasta. Now, I have somebody... Um, you think pasta has carbohydrate? Yes, but your body's going to handle it differently depending on how it's prepared um, and depending on what you have it with. Now, if you have something like, um, you know, like ziti and compare it to, um, you know, vermicelli um, or angel hair pasta, say, um, that angel hair pasta is going to have a lot more surface to volume ratio than the ziti because it's thin. So if you cook it, I'll, you know, but it, so if you cook it, it's going to get absorbed a lot more quickly and that can spike blood sugar more than the ziti. Now, if you take ziti and you say cook it al dente versus cook it very, very thoroughly um, and, and puff it up and get it kind of soft, that's going to be absorbed more quickly than the um, al dente, which has to go through further digestion before it can be absorbed. Even then, cook pasta al dente and eat it plain or eat it coated with some you know olive oil and add some broccoli and things like that some some um you know things that take a lot longer to digest your body is going to not spike your blood sugar uh as well as it would with a similar amount of pasta that's not that's just prepared as is so you know people say well do you ever like talk to, how do you teach people about the glycemic index or the glycemic doom the truth is i don't um, because of those too many, there are too many variables there. Well, I also want to jump in. So there are a couple of things that are going on here. Number one is we talk about, okay, if I have a particular medical or dietary condition, we need to think about things entirely differently. Right. Right. And actually, it, it's actually somebody mentioning the fact that they had an iron deficiency and they were told to stay away from chocolate because of an iron deficiency that actually caused me to come in and we're going to get to that. Right. right? Um, but, um, you know, I think that um, there are, this is, this is where the nuances go. And, you know, I think that, you know, there's a, there's another point here, which is that there's a difference between something called the glycemic index and something which is the glycemic load. Right. Right. And the glycemic index is sort of a number that says, you know, here is the potential 
for a chain for how your body might react to the sugars that are contained here. And the glycemic load is how your body actually metabolizes that and what gets into your system. And the glycemic index focuses, I think, primarily on glucose, right? And the glycemic load is sort of a more comprehensive understanding. So a chocolate covered nut, for example, is going to have a very different glycemic load right then you know a chocolate then a, a peppermint patty which is a chocolate covered sweetened coconut right sweetened um, coconut be, liquid, because right? it's so and, and it's and the glycemic load is also takes into account how people eat stuff which is uh in usually in a mixed meal people don't tend to eat sit down and eat a bowl of undressed pasta but when you start adding it adding it when you start thinking about how people do eat pasta it's usually coated with something and things that you anywhere it's combined with fat or protein or fiber is going to slow down the absorption and it would be the same thing if you had like you said a chocolate coated nut or a let's just say a 70 percent chocolate bar okay that's going to have less sugar meaning that more of those calories are going to be made up of fat it's not that there's more fat in there there is a little bit but it's going to be it's going to have less sugar it's going to spike your blood sugar much more, much less than uh, and actually the chalk the um, the glycemic load of chocolate is pretty moderate um and the higher percentage you go uh, the less sugar there is so the less capable it is of spiking sugar in your blood right so and it's it's not just that there is less sugar it's just that there is more fat and perhaps more fiber. We don't actually know the ratio of fat to what are called non-fat solids and cocoa fat. So we right. don't know that in most bars, we don't know that ratio. But in general, the higher the cocoa content, perhaps the higher the fiber, the non-fat solid, what we think of as cocoa powder, and therefore the higher the fiber content. Right. Those, all things go and, 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 and go ahead, yeah. No, no, no. no I, I was also thinking there's another thing which goes into that. And there's a sort of satiety component, right? So, you know, if, you know, if I have just plain pasta with nothing on it, my own experience is it, especially if it's a white pasta, right? So if it's made from a refined white flour pasta is I tend to be less mindful of it and tend to be more uh, uh, gobble, gobble, gobble with it. Right. right. Whereas if I've got a whole wheat pasta, which is covered with something, I tend to be more mindful about how I'm consuming it. And all of those things have an effect on the way our body thinks about what it is that we're consuming, which says something really important, which is it's less, it's to some extent, it's less important about what we eat. Right. And it's more important about what our body actually metabolizes and retains in the body. And and what's what your, what your body's able to to get sort of thing, which is sort of the what they would call the bioavailability of it. And <clears throat> that's important with not only nutrients we need, but it's also important when we consider nutrients, we <clears throat> excuse me, things we don't need, um, will the body leave it alone or will it take it up anyway? And that um, is sort of um, brings up the issue of, of cadmium and chocolate, where is, I don't think it's a big issue. Nobody thinks it's a big issue except the media. Um, so it's sort of, uh, I, I think of it as a tempest in a teapot. Okay. Cause as, as long as I've been working in my field, which is well over 40 years now, I've never seen anybody with a cadmium, um, toxicity that came from food. Never. Um, so and nor, wanted, nor wanted... have any of any other, uh, and like toxicologists, you know, food toxicologists that I've spoken of, in fact, they look at me like I'm nuts. So I, I agree with you. And we were going to get to cadmium and lead. Um, we got to it a little sooner than I thought we were going to get to it. We can table but, it. Yes. Um, no, 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 no. I mean, it's, it's top of mind right now. So um, there is, so we've talked about this, this difference about what you eat and what you absorb and what retains in your body uh, around this notion of something about the differences between something being hazardous and something being a risk. And so could you explain again, you know, how you would say, what is the difference between something that is hazardous and something that is risky? Well, and then you we know, can compare it, it with you know, other kinds of behaviors. Yeah, it's a, the risk, the, if, the difference between risk and hazard is a hard concept to get across um, because it's a, well, what's, is it the same thing? No, a lot of things can be a hazard that don't pose a risk. Now, when you think about it, water is a hazard water's a hazard, um, not just in terms of weather and things like that, but uh, 
people can die from over consuming water. I mean, it's rare, but it's so, and that's where like, but, but that doesn't mean that water is not a hazard. The question is how much of a risk is that close to nil? Um, and it's sort of like, uh, so, so the idea is a hazard is, does something potentially risky exist? Maybe. Um, and then a risk is looking at that hazard and saying, how much do I need to worry about this? And, well, so, and, and are there strategies, as we talked about, for mitigating the risk? I mean, walking across the street is hazardous, right? right? We mitigate the risk by looking both ways and making sure that there's no car coming. Now, and, I, and, I really and, need... You know, and ahead. by the same token, you could say, well, I don't, I, I don't want to take the risk of walking across the street and you could hide out in your home for the rest of your life. You will be at no risk of you know dying from a car walking across the street. Right. However... What's the benefit there too? You know, um, is are, are you going to are you going to see you know problems because you never leave the house? <laughs> right. Well, and it's contextual too. I mean, you know, yeah. I you know being in you know being somebody who's lived in New York for many many years, I'm an inveterate jaywalker. I just look across the street, and if there's no traffic coming, and I'm no even if I'm within fifty feet of a traffic light, you know, I will cross the street if it if it looks safe. That danger, which I'm very very used to negotiating in New York City becomes very, very risky in London, right? Yes. Because I look the wrong way. Oh God, yeah, I'm, I, I'm with you. And if they didn't have those, a lot of a lot of the corners have those those little signs that say, look this way, you know, this way, uh, I, I, I would be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I could never drive in London. Absolutely no way. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've, you know, I've driven on the other side of the street. I don't like it. Now, Keith, what I want to do is I want to talk, um, get back to talking about this concept of bioavailability very, very quickly, because I think it's important. Now, one of the reasons why people want to consume chocolate is that there is this class of chemicals, um, phytochemicals called flavanols or flavonoids, mm -hmm. right? And we think that these flavanols or flavonoids um, are very, very healthy for us um, in lots of ways. But we need to think about the bioavailability of the flavonoids. So it's not, so is there a recommended daily intake for flavonoids? Do we know how many flavonoids we should be con consuming on a you daily know, basis? That's a hotly debated, debated topic. And for, you know, it, it hasn't been decided yet. Um, what has been known is that they're good, we need them. Um, but the question then becomes, how do we quantify that? And how do we give people a recommendation when, the, when the, there's so much variability, um, even, among, even among the same food? Um, you know, the, how cocoa is handled, for example, can really impact the flavanols uh, and the availability of it, not just the presence, but the availability of it, for example, and even with cocoa so powder. I wanna jump in, I wanna jump in. I want to jump in really quickly there. So a sure. 70%, just because you know 70% cocoa content, right? You don't know anything about the beans used to make the cocoa, how the beans were fermented and how they were roasted. And nope. so two cocos, two chocolate bars of 70% could have wildly different levels of flavanols just right. in the bar. And then we need to worry about whether or not the particular flavanols are bioavailable and how our body is going to be able to take them. And I've interrupted and you continue on your turn. No, that, no, that, but that you, you, you're, you're right. I mean, I, I would say that the average person going and getting a 70% you know, cocoa chocolate bar is going to get flavanols. Okay, you're, 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 there's going to be variability. You're going to get the flavanols. Um, one exception is if that um, chocolate is made out of uh, dutched or L, you know, proce cocoa processed with alcohol, alcohol yeah. that pretty much gets rid of the flavanols or at least about 90 percent of them so uh and that's even that's true with cocoa powder too it's that uh, a lot of you know companies sometimes market a dutch processed cocoa powder uh, great a lot of chefs like it for the you know qualities that it brings to the you know whatever they're cooking or baking um all fine and good from a culinary perspective um from a flavanol perspective not so good because it's it's just not going to be there um, the, the, the alkalination, the alkali alkalinization Alkali process. Alkalization. Right. Yeah. The alkalizing process, um, pretty much destroys those, those flavanols. Um, so just don't look at it for that particular purpose. Regular cocoa powder that's unsweetened, loaded. Most of it's going to be Nat loaded. With it. Natural cocoa powder. So yeah. if you are, 
so, you know, it, one of the things that I talk about, you know, fairly often with people is if they're truly interested in just the health benefits of cocoa and chocolate, number one is that you want to look for it in its least processed form. So you can get a cocoa nib, which is unroasted, right? And it will, you can incorporate it um, into a smoothie. You can throw it into oatmeal. You can throw it as a garnish into salads. I mean, there are lots of ways of incorporating cocoa nibs um, in interesting ways um, in a culinary perspective. Um, if you're, however, if you're um, another op option, again, is to look for natural, which means unalkalized um, cocoa powder. Um, it will be more acidic because that's the reason why alkali alkalization was invented to get rid of um, the residual acidity from fermentation. Um, and it's a blunt instrument, right? As opposed to conching, which enable enables us to selectively get rid of those um, aromas that we're not interested in. Right. And so, uh, you know, there's just general advice. Um, if you were, if you're, if you don't want to supplement, Right, so you're not looking at a cocoa flavanol pill or right. something like that. What you want to do is you want to think about either incorporating cocoa nibs or a natural cocoa powder into your diet in as many ways um, as possible. Right, you know, substitute. You know, in, correct. I mean, yeah, it's just, I mean, a, just it's, a simple. Um, it's it's what I do daily. This is my hot chocolate that's made with a ton of cocoa powder. Uh, also, I like it. Mm -hmm. Dark, dark, thick, rich, that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, it's a good way to get antioxidants. It's, um, at, but you can also add it to smoothies and, you know, lots of different ways. You can cook with it and do savory dishes, add it to chili and, you know, bean dishes and things like that. So it's actually. Right. Cook. I've also found it's a great way to get kids, um, kids to eat their broccoli. Um, so I used to make a roasted broccoli dish for my kid, and I have a sauce, which is um, based on balsamic vinegar and uh -huh. cocoa powder. And so wow. I put, I, so sort of like a hoisin sauce yeah. right, or a Japanese. And so what I would do is I would squeeze a little chocolate sauce. So it's a savory chocolate sauce on top of the broccoli for my kids. And they would eat roasted broccoli. Okay. So just, you got to give me that. You got to give me the recipe. For that. <laughs> it's a really, really simple way to, um, to think about doing it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and it, it's an opportunity for creative fun and expression, which I have also found. What I want, I want to go back to this notion of bioavailability, because I think it's a really, really interesting one. Um, and um, I'm going to put the links to the articles, and you can go, you can go and read them. And I found this um, is in preparation for today. And it's um, in the British Journal of Nutrition. Um, and it's the influence of sugar type on the bioavail bioavailability of cocoa flavanols, which I found to be really, really fascinating. Now, unfortunately, you know, you know, Keith, you'll go look at this and you'll, you'll pull apart the study in some ways. It's a very small cohort. It's like only 15 people, right? Mm -hmm. Were um, So, you know, can we project this statistically significantly? I don't know the answer to that question. Probably not, but maybe depending on how the rest of the study is done. They only took a look at two sugars or two sweeteners for chocolate, maltitol and conventional white sugar, right? Which are very, very different a sugar alcohol and a um, conventional sugar. Um, and the authors say, okay, we only were measuring the results in the blood for four hours after the consumption. Yeah. Right. Of, okay. So, but what they found, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I'll, I haven't read the study yet, but I will, I will, I will guess I will, I'm going to say that okay, um, please do. there was, there was more sugar uptake from the sucrose than there was from the maltitol. Is that what they found? Well, actually, what they're doing is they're talking about the bioavailability, bioavailability of cocoa flavanols, not okay. sugar, sugar metabolism, right? Yeah, well, and yeah, but the, I mean, it's it's going to go hand in hand. I mean, I bet the I, I bet the the sugar increased. Yeah, they the, don't they don't the they don't talk about spike in blood sugar. I, at least I didn't get that. But if you scroll down to the results, what they're talking about is small amounts of sugar, right, will increase the bioavailability of the cocoa flavanols. Okay. All right. right. So it turns out that, again, from a health perspective, if you were to have that cup of hot chocolate that you make, right, and put even, you know, a small amount of some, for to, some sort of natural sugar into it as a sweetener, you will get more of the flavanols being, you know, taken up in your body, right, than if you had uh, an unsweetened chocolate bar or had an unsweetened cup of chocolate, which I think is really, really interesting. It's sort of counterintuitive, I think, for many people that a small amount of sugar, right, will have an increase on the bioavailability 
Of, yeah, because uh, I think people are so used to thinking of sugar as in a negative negative connotation. Right. Um, right. It, it it actually, you know, there are, are things it can can do. I mean, certainly it brings structural property to, the, to some foods. Um, it can stimulate um, the uh, production of melatonin and uh, or serotonin um, in the brain and help you sleep. Um, so not that you want to have a ton of it, but a little bit of it is okay. Um, I always think of, of sugar because some people get adamant that they want to eliminate all sugar in their diet. I'm thinking, okay, you can do that, but that's going to get us again towards obsession. Uh, but I always think use sugar to drive the consumption of some healthful foods. Um, and so, so you use it you as a tool. So are you familiar with the reputation of chocolate and the Kuna Indians in Panama? No, I know. Uh -uh. Right. So they were, they were, they were, there was a study done on them that basically says there's no heart disease among the Kuna Indians who haven't adopted a Western diet. Right. right. And one of the things that they attributed to this to is the consumption of large amounts of cocoa. Right? <laughs> but what's interesting about the way the, the traditional method of preparation is that they boil the cocoa beans with bananas, right? And mm. I'm kind of wondering if, you know, the sugar, well, not only is the banana become a flavoring, but I'm kind of wondering if the sugar, so it's gonna be fructose and sucrose, right? Uh, primarily, uh, right. it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be fructose and, you know, some glucose. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's gonna, you know, it's certainly gonna have sugar in it. Right. But that sugar could right, work synergistically to improve the bioavailability of because, you know, of whatever flavanols are available. Um, it, it, so it I may, think it's, you know, I think it's it really very well. And also um, it, it can enhance availability. Um, some foods can diminish availability of, of other nutrients, um, you right. know, so it can it can work um, kind of both ways. Um, so we Keith, I think that's a really, really good segue. You're very, very good at segueing me between things today. Um, and before we get to that, I want to say, uh, do a quick reset because we're about halfway through today's episode. Uh, my name is Clay Gordon. My guest today is Keith Ayub. Keith is a regular contributor to the chocolate life. He's been a guest on the chocolate life live and here on pod safe chocolate. And we're talking about chocolate and your health, um, a guide to 2024. If you're in the midst of making new year's resolutions and thinking about how I'm going to think about chocolate for the rest of the year, that's the, that's what we want to be talking about today. Now, if you have a question about anything having to do with chocolate and your health, um, throw it into the comments. You're watching on LinkedIn, you're watching on Facebook or the live chat in YouTube. Um, Keith and I will see it here on the screen. We'll get your question up on the, up on the screen and we'll get it asked and hopefully answered. And if you just want to let us know where in the world you're connecting from, we already have um, some people. I know that we've got um, Colorado, we've got uh, Missouri. Um, I don't know where Frank is at the moment, um, nor where she, um, Mari, um, but we've got people who connect from all over the world for these, for these episodes. Um, so Keith, when we talk about the presence of, so two food, two foods, two, two foods, Two or more foods when consumed together, right, can either reinforce each other or they can um, reduce the, the um, reduce their uh, nutritional potential. Right. So they can enhance or break them down. And that's where um, I had, um, I, I was on the r slash chocolate Reddit, subreddit, and somebody asked this question about, I didn't ask a question, just made a blanket um, a blanket assertion that if for some reason you have any kind of um, iron deficiency or anemia, you need to completely stay away from chocolate. And one of the reasons, so this immediately engaged in a, 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 a not well-founded discussion back and forth among many of the members about what it was in the cocoa and the chocolate that might be interfering with iron metabolism. And so first, number one, let's talk about iron um, as a mineral and you know what it's good for. Um, and then what are the sorts of things that might enhance and what are some of the, the substances that might get in the way of iron inception? And when do you need to worry about it? Because I think this is the point. When, yeah. do, when does it become an issue for you in your diet that you need to worry about it? And I'm not expecting anybody to go took a look, take a look at the URL here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the link to this um, non-anemic iron deficiency um, post 
um, which was in, um, in an Australian publication. I'm going to put it on the page for today's post, and you can go and look at this afterwards. But Keith, let's do like a deep dive into iron and chocolate and your body. Yeah, and thank you. And and um, iron deficiency anemia is a very common, you know, um, nutritional deficiency, probably one of the most common in the world. Um, and you, I mean, a lot of people, that's why when you go to the doctor, they test your hematocrit, your hemoglobin, and those are very gross measures of iron deficiency anemia. Uh, but you can have an iron deficiency without that showing up as um, a low hematocrit or a low hemoglobin level. Um, and that's sort of, so, and it can also come about for a variety of reasons, what they call anemia of chronic disease and, and you know, medications and that somebody might be on for a lot of reasons, um, you can have low iron uptake. Um, and, uh, you know. So if I can just really quickly, it sure. can be, it can be something which is genetic, right? So it could be as a result of some aspect of your metabolism which is not working properly, right? So, or your body chemistry that's not working properly. Um, it, it can be the fact that you're consuming enough. So the body doesn't, does the body manufacture iron? Or no, does it need iron's to be a mineral. Uh, iron's a mineral. It's an you know it's it's an element. It's in the earth. It's you can't break it down any further. Um, but that said, it's combined with a lot of other compounds that can render it more absorbable or less absorbable. Um, it's certainly necessary for multiple body functions and 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 enzymatic reactions, etc. And 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 your red blood cells and all kinds of other things in the body. So it's important to get it. Um, and you know, and it's it, and it's a it's it's a it's a mineral, which means we want it. It's not toxic, which means we wouldn't. You know, um, and um, you know, it can be impacted by a lot of a, a lot of um, a lot of factors. Um, one of the things that is um, important to know is that a lot of people don't eat enough foods with iron. Um, it's one of the reasons they enriched. Um, refined flours and uh, refined grains is actually so it's it's not just you know white flour it's you know rice and multiple other grains um, breakfast cereal etc because um, it's it's that important and you don't want people going without it um, but there are also uh, but you only absorb about 10 15 percent of the iron you eat um, so it's, it's, it's also diff it's also easy for you know, iron to kind of just pass right through you and not be absorbed. There are a lot of other minerals, for example, that compete for the absorption, um, with it. And also iron needs an acid medium to enhance the absorption. So if that's, you know, people say, well, why would you put it in breakfast cereal then? Um, because most people are going to have that with milk. Milk is actually not a, an acid medium. Um, it doesn't eliminate absorption, but it does hamper it to a certain degree. So they actually amp up the um, the, uh, the the presence of iron in many breakfast cereals, and they amp up the presence of iron in um, refined in, in refined grains to kind of counteract for that. Uh, but there are other things that also can you know impact iron absorption. Right, and it's one of the reasons, if I can, that you know when I look at cereal and it says part of this healthy breakfast, there's always a glass of orange juice. And so the acidity necessary to increase uptake actually comes from the juice component of it. Right. And, and your stomach, way. your stomach actually, you know, actually has, well, also that it could also be um, vitamin C that is put on the fruit in the, in, you know, on the cereal, it could be, you know, well, your stomach acid also is acid. Um, the question is, does it act soon enough before the food gets sort of into the gut? Um, and you know, that's, that's not a guarantee for everybody. Um, okay. but also, um, other compounds that are in really healthy foods can impact iron absorption. Um, oxalates, for example, are, are present in a lot of healthy foods, green leafy vegetables come to mind, nuts, beans, etc. Uh, and those can kind of tie into um, iron absorption or iron bioavailability because they can uh, kind of hook onto the iron and render it you know, less absorbed. Um, that doesn't mean you don't eat green leafy vegetables and beans and nuts and things like that. It just means that you kind of have to be aware of that. And uh, a little acidic food is a you know, it's definitely a good thing to do. So that's why it's a good, you know, it's good to have a mix. Uh, does that mean that somebody who has an iron deficiency should avoid um, all foods with oxalate? No. Um, I always think of, um, and, and by the way, if somebody is wondering whether they have you know, an iron deficiency, this is very easy to test. There are, in fact, the 
And the paper goes through a number of ways that a uh, number, number of tests that are actually very common. They may not be familiar to other people, but they are to like very, virtually every health professional. Things like, um, you know, serum ferritin as a measure of iron status, uh, total iron binding capacity um, is a measure of iron status. Um, uh, you know, so serum ferritin, serum ferritin trans saturation uh, and, and total iron binding capacity. In other words, if um, your saturation is, is low, that means you got a lot more room to saturate, which means you got to, you got to, you got to get more iron in there. If your total iron capacity, iron binding capacity is high, that means um, you have the high capacity, you have capacity to bind a lot more iron than you're getting. So you can get more iron in there. So, um, you know, those are, are measures that are very familiar and could be, it can be tested. They're often part of a routine evaluation. So um, check with your doctor if you're concerned about it at all. Uh, and that'll tell you whether or not, uh, even if you have a, a normal, um, you know, hematocrit and a normal hemoglobin level, you might still be iron sort of, uh, if not iron deficient, then you want to at least wonder why. Um, now that's not always due to diet, Clay. I want to make it real clear. Sometimes it's because you're losing you know, you're losing iron, you're bleeding, or, you know, there can be medical reasons why you'd be losing iron. Um, this is rare in men. It's more common in women because they menstruate and they lose blood every month, um, mm -hmm. at least women of childbearing age. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's something to discuss with your doctor if you have any concerns about it. And then also, um, I guess, should you be avoiding chocolate? Um, why would that even crop up? Well, chocolate is a source of both tannins and oxalates, uh, not a huge source, sort of a moderate source, um, but can that bind iron and make it less absorbable? Yes. Is it going to do this to cause somebody to have an iron deficiency? I have to tell you again, I'm not, I'm not seeing that at all. So I want to jump in here really, really quickly and just reinforce a point that Keith just made. Um, he may be a doctor. I'm not. Right? I'm a doctor but, of nutrition. I'm not a medical doctor. So that's right, I understand. You're a doctor of nutrition. And a registered medical, dietitian. So And a registered dietitian. So I want to go in there and say, if you have any, so this is not medical advice. No. Um, this is just guidance. If you have a concern, go talk to a doctor. And this is one of the things that you talked a lot about, you know, Keith, when we were looking at, you know, cadmium and lead. Right in so in in the diet. So yes, cadmium and lead are both bad for you. Right. The question becomes: you may consume a certain amount, and it's not really. It, to some extent, it doesn't matter the the well if the levels are over a certain amount of what you consume. What matters is what metabolizes and is retained in the body. And so you say that if you're worried about cadmium, what you need to do is you need to get a specific type of urine test. Right. And oh, an actual blood about, test. It's a blood test, so it's, it's lead. lead that's the. And you can test. do both. You can do both with cadmium, but um, um, okay. with lead, it's a blood right. test. Yeah, and um, and right. as I say, I've worked with people who have had lead, lead you know, lead exposure, lead toxicity, um, and has it ever come from food? No, never. Uh, and actually, food isn't even in on the government's list of major uh, sources uh, of lead. It's uh, it's like way down on the list. And what is you know, where it does come in is like number 10 out of 10. Um, and it's not foods that we commonly eat. Um, it's foods that but like basically it's candy that's a few candies that are imported, uh, tam some tamarind candy that comes from Mexico, you know, things that are relatively obscure. Um, so it, it shouldn't be something that people should worry about from food, at least with lead. With cadmium, uh, kind of ditto because uh, cadmium is, um, you know, present in the soil. It's another element. It's not always there because of toxicity. It's been there forever. It was, as I like to say, um, uh, and, man, and many plants are what we call bioaccumulators. So they will, you know, if it's in the soil, they will take it into the um, the plant itself. And it's some of it that can end up in the edible portion of the plant. Um, but cocoa, while it's a source of, it can be a source of cadmium, um, it is so are a lot of other foods that we actually want people to eat um and again come back to whole grains and green leafy vegetables far greater sources of cadmium uh than cocoa would be and is anybody worried about those no right. nor should so, they be interesting question so is there a relationship between um 
iron uptake in cadmium uptake? Because I seem to remember somehow that, you know, iron, if you were iron deficient, you might actually have C, um, higher residual levels of cadmium in the body. Or was that lead? I forget which one it was. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, we always tell people if like to minimize the chance of lead uptake, have a healthy, balanced diet. Uh, okay, that's going to include um, the foods that that compete for for uptake by lead. Um, you know, and compete with lead for uptake. So those would be things like good high, like uh, good sources of iron, the good sources of other minerals like calcium, uh, phosphorus, magnesium. All these are present in again. Um, the foods we want people to eat more of, you know, leafy vegetables, whole grains, nuts, beans, you know, peas, lentils, all that kind of stuff. Those have, those are, you know, those all contain a lot of minerals and those minerals are going to basically compete with um, cadmium and they will usually win because cadmium is just not something that you, you tend to get toxic from um, with food. Um, basic exposure to cadmium, that's you know, the biggest uptake is through inhalation. So smoke. Right. So I want to, you were, again, you're doing a really good job of like anticipating where I'm going. So <laughs> I try. You know, there's a lot, of, well, you're doing a great job today. So you know, if we look at sort of where the scare is coming from in the United States, so let's not talk about the EU, the EU regulations at the moment. Let's talk about the US. And it's just, so at the federal level, um, you know, cadmium and lead have very, very different what are called acceptable levels than in the state of California. So Prop 65, right? Related regional. Oh, regional. yeah. So, so, but let's think about this. So can you tell what people, what NOE means in the context of, you know, the diet? So if, if you've got a level, which is called NOE, right? Which I've heard um, of as I'm, no I'm, I'm familiar with the, the NOEL, which is that no observed adverse effect level. Um, right. And I right. think that's yep. what you, you might mean. Yep. Um, yeah, that's sort of how they set levels um, uh, of, of, and whether it's, you know, cadmium or lead or uh, levels of pesticide or anything but that might be potentially toxic. Um, again, you've heard that phrase, the dose makes the poison. And they always say also, the dose brings the benefit. That's the other half of that sentence. Um, yeah. Because, um, yeah, iron's an important mineral, but you can overdose on it too. Um, you know, and I, 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 I use the example, to indulge me for a minute. It's like, if you were going to put out a new food and it was going to have everything in it and it was going to have protein and it was going to have fiber and it was going to have all kinds of minerals and all kinds of vitamins. And it was, you know, easy to get and it was cheap and every, perfect food. And we're going to call this food beans. Would you be able to market it today? And I wonder, and you're going to say, right. well, but how much do you tell people to have? Because it can have all kinds of GI problems and GI impact on people. While well, you shouldn't be marketing this because, you know, maybe a quarter cup is one good for one person. And if a cup is, can be tolerated by somebody, you have no clue about how to recommend, the, you know, your consumption of this food. Think about it. And, and yeah. it, it gives you pause because the dose can bring the poison, but it can also bring the benefit. Okay. So there we go. Yeah. I I remember being a freshman at the Ever Evergreen State College back in 1976, right? And reading a book called um, um, Diet for a Small Planet. I oh, yeah. Frankie LePay, yeah. Yes. And, you know, talking about the notion of complementary proteins and complementary foods, so beans and rice. So you need to have amino acids in particular balance for the right. protein to be available. And if you're deficient in one amino acid, that will tell you, the amount of protein that you can get. Right. So you're putting and, foods together. And, and one of the things with um, with iron is that plant iron is a little different than animal sourced iron. Um, animal sourced iron is attached to hemoglobin. Okay, it's called heme iron. Um, the iron that is in most plant foods, it, it, basically it's non-heme iron, but it's also bound. And that's where it can be bound to oxalates or bound to phytic acid or other things that are in green leafy vegetables and other foods like that. And that's where the acid comes in because the acid will help liberate that and basically oh. cleave it off of the um, oxalate salt or the uh, or the um, the phytic acid uh, and render that iron a little bit more uh, available. Um, so, gotcha. Which is why 
having a balance, I mean, this is one of the challenges for a vegan diet. It turns out that the highest bioavailability sources of what we're looking for are going to be in animal proteins as opposed to plants. Well, also the highest quality, well, in, in, in most cases, quality. the higher yeah. quality proteins are going to be found in animal sources, which makes sense. We're animals. That's why, you know, we if we eat, you know, um, an animal, it's going to be a little bit closer to kind of what we need. Um, in terms of the balance of amino acids. It doesn't mean you can't do it in a vegan diet, uh, but it does mean uh, I get concerned when people come to me and say, well, I really would like to be a vegan. Okay, how willing are you to eat beans on a regular basis, like every single day? In some form, could be tofu, could be beans out of a can or whatever, but you've got to have beans in your diet because it's the hugest source of protein for you, not just in terms of quality, but in terms of quantity. And so, well, I, I don't think I want to do it every day. I said, well, then we need to really talk about how we're going to become vegan or how vegan you want to become. And it doesn't have to be an all or none phenomenon by any means. You know, right. that's what a whole flexitarian basis is about. Um, you know, and 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 yeah. you know you can get plenty and I you know I think people would be surprised if they learned about the nutrients, for example, they might actually end up eating a lot more you're using a lot more cocoa powder if they knew what was in it. It's actually really right. cool. Right. And and again you, we can go back to this about we one of the um, minerals that's found um, in cocoa often is magnesium. And many people are, in fact, magnesium deficient, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and, and magnesium, and they probably wouldn't be if they ate enough fruit and vegetables, to be honest with you, because that plant food is a really great source of magnesium. Some animal foods are as well. Um, but with magnesium, um, that's the core of chlorophyll. Um, if you think of the heme molecule and the chlorophyll molecule, the big difference is that the heme molecule has iron at its core, the chlorophyll molecule has magnesium at its core. So think of that because they're structurally very similar otherwise. So yeah, get enough fruits and vegetables, get enough green stuff. Um, and, you know, and, and, and if anybody was going to make a resolution, I'd say, look, that would be a really good one to have a plant more more often. Uh, you don't have to be vegetarian. You don't have to be vegan. Have a few more plants, okay? Um, actually, um, I, I'm a um, advisor, volunteer advisor to the Produce for Better Health Foundation, um, and our hashtag is Have a Plant. So I'm a big fan of uh, getting people to eat more plant food, regardless of what kind of an eating style you have, uh, in any way, shape, or form. You know, I think it's it's um, it doesn't have to be. People think you have to be. It has to be fresh food. No, some things have to be processed. Cocoa is one of them. You, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's for most people, it's going to have to be processed. And that actually, speaking of which, that processing can render foods a lot more available. It's not that unprocessed foods um, is, is a better way to have it. It's not always the case. Um, and I'm not sure too many people are going to want to eat ground up raw cocoa beans. Um, <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. But what I can't. But it does bring another. It does bring up another point. Is that you know one extreme, one one kind of extreme from the vegan diet, and one more is the raw vegan diet, right? Oh, yeah. Because there's an assumption that un, unprocessed foods are just better for you. And one place is where this is definitely not the case is broccoli. So lightly steamed broccoli or lightly cooked broccoli is going to make. Um, most of the nutrients in the broccoli more bioavailable. So you're better off eating lightly steamed, lightly roasted broccoli than you are eating raw broccoli. Well, and, and that's actually not just true for broccoli. It can be true for many vegetables. Um, although I, I'm a fan of saying eat them whatever way you like them, but you don't have mm -hmm. to, you don't have to eat everything raw. Um, and another big example is in tomatoes. Um, the lycopene in, in a raw tomato is not as bioavailable as the lycopene in, say, a tomato sauce or a tomato paste. So tomato paste, uh, it's really concentrated tomatoes, and it, that, the lycopene content of that is going to be way higher. Um, so if, any, if anybody likes spicy food, I'm, I'm going to give you a really quick recipe for one of the best hot sauces you can have, and you make it on oh, your own, right? Count and, me in. Um, so it's really, really simple. Get a can of pickled jalapenos right? and the, the slices, not whole, not whole slices, but a can of pickle. I'm sorry, Keith. Uh, no, I didn't say anything. Are we having connection problems again? Yes. Having connection problems. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, so get a can of pickled jalapeno 
beers, right? Get a can of chipotles in adobo. Get a can of um, crushed tomatoes of your favorite variety, right? Unflavored, right? And then get a can of black beans. Ooh, cooked black beans, right? Right. So uh, rinse the black beans, you, or you can save the aquafaba if you want to make something with it, right? But then throw all of those into a blender. Right. Um, so you can change the heat level by changing the ratio of chipotles to jalapenos, right? But what you've got is the beans, right? And um, the tomatoes in there with the heat providing um, elements of it. It makes a oh, really wonderful thick sauce, right? Right. And imagine it's like one can of each. You can imagine it makes quite a bit of it. It's relatively inexpensive. Right. Um, and it keeps really well. So you put it in the fridge and it'll last a month or two in your fridge. But it's a great way to make a hot sauce. And this is what I do. I mean, I will go. I have some of this in my fridge at almost at almost all times. And so mm. I can get my beans. I can get my lycopenes and I can adjust the heat. It's got pickled peppers and the peppers are good for you. Right. As well. It's there's a lot of stuff going on there. It's 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 my own. It's my own gift to everybody. Go out and play with it, you know, and, you know, do whatever it is that you want with it um, and have fun with it. It's it's what it is that I do. And it doesn't require a lot of measuring. And that's 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 cool, too. So uh, yeah. no measuring, no, no, no turning on the stove uh, like those kind nope. of recipes. Yeah, if you can no, open a can, you can do this. If you can open a can and you have a blender, you can yes. use, or I, I used to do it with a stick blender before I had an actual blender. Right. So you can you can do it very easily. And, and again, you, if you want to, you can throw in other spices to be able to um, expand what you're doing. So you could add a little bit of turmeric in it uh, if you're interested in that. Not so much that it really changes the color, um, but, you know, go play with it. There are lots of, oh, lots yeah. of things that you can add to it. I see some um, oregano you know, in there, so you could certainly do that. Yeah, Ore no oregano, well, garlic. Yeah, you could throw garlic. Um, um, yeah, lots. Of, I would. I would. What would? What are your thoughts about raw garlic as opposed to slightly cooked garlic? So, would you put? A, so, could you do a head of roasted garlic and use roasted garlic as opposed to raw garlic? Talk about you know. And I, I'm you know just from a health because I hadn't thought about you know upping the garlic content of what it is. Uh, well, I, you know, if if raw garlic is chopped up and in something, it's fine. I mean, most people aren't going to eat a huge amount of it. It's not typically a side dish for people, you know. So, uh, if it's roasted, different story. Um, and it's a little bit easier to eat. So, you know, you can make a recommendation of whether that, but it's, is it really something that everybody's going to eat? Now, if you're putting a couple of cloves or a clove into something like the salsa recipe, fair game. Um, and it, over time, will probably give you more garlic flavor, um, but also have a little bit less sort of garlicky, you know, tones to it because you're having, again, there's an acid in there. Uh, in that salsa um, with the, between the tomatoes and the peppers. And the acid can actually tame some of that um, intense garlicky, um, you know, nuance there. Um, so I'm, like if I, when I'm cutting up garlic, um, it, can be, it can be less bitter if you combine it with an acid right away. Um, so if I'm chopping up garlic, I might squeeze a little bit of um, lemon juice over Lime it. Or some and it, yeah. it tames it a little bit from, from getting too bitter. You know, I also yeah. cut a little bit at the end, uh, at the stem end, um, and leave that out. Yeah, and I'd be, I'd, you know, I'd just, number one, is I'd, I'd be tempted to put a little bit of both in, right, just for the balance, right? And oh, then right. also, right, for the balance, and also um, garlic is known as an antiseptic, as an antimicrobial. And yeah. so it would have the effect of extending the shelf life. Yes, uh, and, and it, it does. And and right. please, people, it may be have antiseptic and antimicrobial properties. It is not a substitute for medicine, please. So oh, I don't want anybody right. getting that information yeah. and say, oh, well, I don't need to do that. I'll just get gone. No. If, you, right. if you're prescribed medication, get it. <laughs> if you are do not, do not self-treat with this because people get well, hot right. ideas about that. Uh, no, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, this is something that we could do that would have the added benefit of extending the shelf life yeah, in it, as well as some flavoring aspect and, of it. And well. quite all those ingredients that you mentioned are fabulous for uh, gut health. Um, so they mm -hmm. are are really excellent foods for gut health, as is pretty much all kinds of different fibers. You know, there's fiber is not just one type of 
you know, compound. There are many, many different types of fiber. Um, and, you know, you know, certainly, you know, the fiber that's in cocoa powder is part of that, you know, and that feeds healthy gut bacteria. So it's another reason to include it in a smoothie. Right. And by the way, you could add cocoa powder into this um, salsa. I'll bet. Yeah. So, which I, which I have done. So it's, or just if you have some leftover high cocoa content chocolate and you can grate it in or grate it on a microplane and you incorporate it in that way, all kinds of ways. It's just a really, really wonderful basic idea. Um, and I use it, um, you know, I do, I'm, you know, I use it like many people use ketchup. It is my, it is my ketchup. As a matter I could fact. actually um, see that also. I, I'm a, a I tend to eat unflavored Greek yogurt. I could see that as a savory topping for yogurt. Um, yeah, Greek yogurt. Yeah. Right. I, I use it to flavor soups. I use it to flavor um, chilies and all that, and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's just a really, really wonderful all around. Um, that and the cocoa before. powder, I think is, is, a, is a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it, it is, it is, it is, it is really good. Um, I want to, we're right at the hour. What I want to do is do a quick shout out to chef Jeffrey Gardner, um, who I had the, absolute pleasure of meeting in person for the first time. Jeff has been a, a follower of mine. We've had correspondences, you know, I don't know, for early, for Choc since Chocophile days, which means before 2008, um, we've been following each other. We've been, he's been a regular visitor here on the Chocolate Life Live and the Pod Safe Chocolate, but we've never actually met each other in person. So I was in Los Angeles, right, um, the week before Christmas, uh, something like that. And we had a chance to spend a couple of hours talking about um, our lives and about chocolate. He gave me some chocolate. Um, we're going to have a live tasting of many of his chocolates um, when we have the opportunity to here in a little while. Um, he gave me a selection of five of them. And I want to say, Jeffrey, thank you very much for um, the New Year's greeting. And I want um, and you know, all my best to you and your family um, over the course and to everybody who's watching it, all the best to you and your family over the course of the next couple of um, over the next year. And you know, Keith, what I want to do also is I want to close um, on what I think is the most important aspect of this for me, this whole discussion for me, right? As someone who consumes a lot of chocolate professionally, right? And I have to distinguish between recreational eating and professional eating, right? So, and it's about this obsession. So one of the things that I try to do just as a health, overall health thing is how do I reduce stress in my life? Right. Um, and what I, this sort of obsessing over, is this the healthiest chocolate, right, is a source of stress in my life. And so I don't, right. So one of my definitions for a recreational chocolate is a chocolate that when I put it in my mouth, it puts a smile on my face, right. That's one of my different, if I can put a piece of chocolate in my mouth and it puts a smile on my face, it's good. It's good. I mean, that's the baseline for it. If it doesn't put a smile on my face, I have to, yeah, you know, it's, it's not a good chocolate, right? Yeah. But, but if I put a piece of chocolate in my mouth and it puts a smile on my face, one of the things that process does is it lowers my blood pressure. Right. And so sometimes I wonder how much of a challenge is it sort of teaching, teasing out the psychological effect of consuming chocolate on health as opposed to the actual biological effects. I mean, it, it, it would yeah, be possible we, to, design, to design a study that, that does that? You know, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be a challenge, that's for sure. Yeah. What, I, what I would probably advise somebody is, you know, again, come back to, you know, quantity um, and quality as well. And make sure that if you put it in your mouth, it's something that you actually really like. So don't, you know, consume the chocolate just because it's there or it's sort of like, um, an impulse food or something, do it because you really enjoy it. And then within that, so it's putting your smile on your face and then talk about, okay, how much of this is a reasonable amount for me to have? Now, as a professional chocolate eater, you know, consumer, that, that's a different story. But for the consumer, um, if you, you're not going to go, um, in my professional opinion, I guess um, you won't go wrong with, with an, certainly starting with figuring an ounce a day, is about 150 to 170 calories. And if that is your dessert, uh, for example, it's going to be lower in calories than most desserts. And if it puts a really good smile on your face, that's a win because certainly it's going to displace something that's a lot higher in calories. But it's also, if, especially if it's, a, if it's a higher cocoa percentage chocolate, it's going to be uh, giving you a few extra benefits. There's, there's some protein in there, some fiber in there. 
antioxidants as well. So like you can feel a little better about eating that than you could something that's, you know, just something that's typically loaded with sugar and doesn't carry a lot of other nutrients with it. Right. And, you know, and with that, I think that's a perfect place to put a an, an exclamation point or a period on the end of this. Um, and people, you know, when you're thinking about chocolate in your diet and resolutions for the upcoming year, just a couple of key points that I think we can take away with this. The first one is don't obsess. Right? Yes. So don't overthink it. Right. Um, now, if you have a specific medical or dietary um something condition going on in your body. like do all this with the with the help of your that, um, medical that has, yeah that has to come first right yeah. so make sure you should be make sure but um this whole notion that keith um keith put together really 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 important um here um and we're going to do it um and we just really want to put an emphasize on it is that um you can use chocolate right in, to number one you know address some of the some of the um the vitamin or mineral or other aspects of your diet that you need to get to right so for example one of the reasons why it's said that many um, women who menstruate crave chocolate is because of the magnesium um, i don't know if that's ever been proven but that is something that has been um, mentioned about it um but there is you know chocolate tends to have a lot of magnesium in it and so one could see that you know consuming chocolate um during um menses would um would um would alleviate or a, a craving so you can you can you can certainly use cocoa or chocolate not as medication stay away from that right but it, you can use it to plug the gaps in your diet right but i think that most importantly and for me when i think about living the chocolate life and you know what it is that i want to promote and what it is that i'm doing is that um, if you're working with chocolate every day, right, you're doing something that makes you happy, right? You're smelling it, right? It's, mm -hmm. it, you're tasting it. it you're, make, you're, you're working with something that makes people happy, right? And the gift of giving somebody chocolate is this gift of sharing happiness and connection, which I think is important. So when you think about, when I think about chocolate, what I want to do is I want to maximize the enjoyment of it. So think about how you can use chocolate as a way to maximize your own happiness, right? And the happiness of those around you by sharing the chocolate. And that gift of joy, that gift of happiness um, is a virtuous circle. It's a virtuous cycle, right? That I think is really, really important not to overlook in this discussion of chocolate and your health. Right. Um, and Keith, I want to say thank you very much. Did it. A quick shout out to Stan Larson, another long time a friend and colleague um, who wants to thank us for um, the insight um, on today's uh, episode. Before we leave, I just want to let everybody know that um, this is the Chocolate Life. You can go there. Um, there is a post on this um, um, on this episode. There are a couple of articles that I talked to. I I will link to them. I will put them in this. I will put the recipe for the hot sauce that we we're talking about in there, or at least not a recipe. It's just a rough guideline. Um, and I want to close by saying um, thank you to all of the members of The Chocolate Life. Every episode of Pod Safe Chocolate right, is uh, sponsored by the members of The Chocolate Life. And you can go there. Um, I'm logged in. Um, so you know my page says account. You go there. It says click on join. So click on join. Um, and support the Chocolate Life in 2024 uh, to be able to get lots of insights like this um, over the rest of the year. Keith, plans for the next couple of days, next couple of weeks? Um, I am actually yeah, going to be doing some traveling between now and the end of February, so that's good. Yes, I've got uh, domestically, but uh, a lot of it. So uh, you know, but I do want to give a shout out to everybody who joined the chat and uh, hello to Bruce, Bruce, and, and Encore. Hi guys. Yeah, um, great. And I just want to remind everybody um, that um, oh, I should say Saturday. I, I will yeah. always travel on a plane with a bar of really good artisan chocolate. So that's, that's a must. <laughs> if you've been stuck on the tarmac, it's really helpful. <laughs> and it's a great way to make friends with flight attendants. Oh, yes. I, I have used I have used chocolate um, to, um, uh, on a difficult flight with the flight crew, if I've got an extra one that I can share, um, I will often share it with members of the cabin crew, give them a really, uh, quick, um, insight into what it is. Um, I've got a 
a couple of really, really wonderful travel stories like that. Okay. One okay. of which, in, so it's just, but I mean, it's, it's a really, really, so uh, I won't call it a bribe, but um, you will often get um, special attention from the flight crew. Um, if you can share with them something um, and make sure it's a whole bar, right. That is, uh, that hasn't been open just as a, as a present. Um, um, I want to remind everybody that um, we will be doing an episode of pod safe chocolate this coming Friday, which is the 5th of January, but on the 6th, I'm flying to Nigeria and I'm going to be gone for um, eight days. So flying back on the 14th. Um, so we have the International Cocoa and Chocolate Forum organized by International Cocoa Diplomacy. Um, I don't think I'll have an opportunity to do an episode of Pod Save Chocolate on traveling on travel days on Tuesday and Friday. So I don't think it'll work, but I will do a follow-up when it is that I get back. So I'm looking forward to returning to Nigeria. I have all my paperwork, all my tickets, everything in hand. So I'm looking forward to going and doing that. And with that, again, thank you very, very much, Keith, for being a part of today. And to remind everybody, if you're working with chocolate and you're not having fun, you are doing it wrong. And right. that's my great advice for 2024. Ciao, everyone. Until the next time.